Nihilism, The Root of the Revolution of the Modern Age by Eugene Father Seraphim Rose. Editor's Preface. In the basement apartment near downtown San Francisco in the early 1960s, Eugene Rose, the future Father Seraphim, sat at his desk covered with stacks of books and piles of paper folders. The room was perpetually dark, for little light could come in from the window. Some years before Eugene had moved there, a murder had occurred in that room, and some said that an ominous spirit still lingered there. But Eugene, as if in defiance of this spirit and the ever-darkening spirit of the city around him, had one wall covered with icons, before which a red icon lamp always flickered. In this room, Eugene undertook to write a monumental chronicle of modern man's war against God, man's attempt to destroy the old order and raise up a new one without Christ, to deny the existence of the kingdom of God and raise up his own earthly utopia in its stead. This projected work was entitled The Kingdom of Man and the Kingdom of God. Only a few years before this, Eugene himself had been ensnared in the kingdom of man and had suffered in it. He too had been at war against God. Having rejected the Protestant Christianity of his formative years as being weak and ineffectual, he had taken part in the bohemian counterculture of the 1950s and had delved into Eastern religions and philosophies which taught that God is ultimately impersonal. Like the absurdist artists and writers of his day, he had experimented with insanity, breaking down logical thought processes as a way of breaking on over to the other side. He read the words of the mad prophet of nihilism, Friedrich Nietzsche, until those words resonated in his soul with an electric, infernal power. Through all these means, he was seeking to attain to truth or reality with his mind, but they all resulted in failure. He was reduced to such a state of despair that when later asked to describe it, he could only say, I was in hell. He would get drunk and would grapple with the god whom he had claimed was dead, pounding on the floor and screaming at him to leave him alone. Once while intoxicated, he wrote, I am sick, as all men are sick who are absent from the love of God. Atheism, Eugene wrote in later years, true existential atheism, burning with hatred of a seemingly unjust or unmerciful God, is a spiritual state. It is a real attempt to grapple with the true God, whose ways are so inexplicable even to the most believing of men and it has more than once been known to end in a blinding vision of him whom the real atheist truly seeks. It is Christ who works in these souls. The Antichrist is not to be found primarily in the great deniers, but in the small affirmers, whose Christ is only on the lips. Nietzsche, in calling himself Antichrist, proved thereby his intense hunger for Christ. It was in such a condition of intense hunger that Eugene found himself in the late 1950s. And then, like a sudden gust of wind, there entered into his life a reality that he never could have foreseen. Towards the end of his life, he recalled this moment. For years in my studies, I was satisfied with being above all traditions, but somehow faithful to all of them. When I visited an Orthodox church, it was only in order to view another, quote, tradition. However, when I entered an Orthodox church for the first time, a Russian church in San Francisco, something happened to me that I had not experienced in any Buddhist or other Eastern temple. Something in my heart said that this was home that all my search was over. I didn't really know what this meant because the service was quite strange to me and in a foreign language. I began to attend Orthodox services more frequently, gradually learning its language and customs. 
With my exposure to orthodoxy and to orthodox people, a new idea began to enter my awareness, that truth was not just some abstract idea, sought and known by the mind, but was something personal, even a person, sought and loved by the heart, and that is how I met Christ. While working on the kingdom of man and the kingdom of God in his basement apartment, Eugene was still coming to grips with what he had found. He had come upon the truth in the undistorted image of Christ as preserved in the Eastern Orthodox Church, but he yearned to enter what he called the heart of hearts of that church, its mystical dimension, not its boring, worldly, organizational aspect. He wanted God, and he wanted him passionately. His writings from this time were a kind of catharsis for him, a means of emerging out of untruth, out of the underground darkness and into the light. Although they are philosophical in tone, much more so than his later works, these early writings were born of an intense suffering that was still very fresh in his soul. It was only natural that he would write much more about the kingdom of man in which he had suffered all his life than about the kingdom of God, of which he had as yet only caught a glimpse. It was still through the prism of the kingdom of man that he viewed the kingdom of God. Of all the 14 chapters Eugene planned to write for his magnum opus, only the seventh was typed in completed form. The rest remain in handwritten notes. This seventh chapter, which we present here, was on the philosophy of nihilism. Nihilism, the belief that there is no absolute truth, that all truth is relative, is, Eugene affirmed, the basic philosophy of the 20th century. Quote, It has become, in our time, so widespread and pervasive, has entered so thoroughly and so deeply into the hearts and minds of all living men today, that there is no longer any front on which it may be fought. End quote. The heart of this philosophy, he said, was, quote, expressed most clearly by Nietzsche and by a character of Dostoevsky in the phrase, God is dead, therefore man becomes God and everything is possible, end quote. From his own experience, Eugene believed that modern man cannot come to Christ fully until he is first aware of how far he and his society have fallen away from him that is, until he has first faced the nihilism in himself. Quote, the nihilism of our age exists in all, end quote. He wrote, quote, in those who do not, with the aid of God, choose to combat it in the name of the fullness of being of the living God, are swallowed up in it already. We have been brought to the edge of the abyss of nothingness, and whether we recognize its nature or not, we will, through affinity for the ever-present nothingness within us, be engulfed in it, beyond all hope of redemption, unless we cling in full and certain faith, which doubting does not doubt, to Christ, without whom we are truly nothing." End quote. As a writer, Eugene felt he must call his contemporaries back from the abyss. He wrote not only out of his own desire for God, but out of his concern for others who desired him also, even those who, as he himself had once done, rejected God or warred against him out of their very desire for him. Out of his pain of heart, out of the darkness of his former life, Eugene speaks to contemporary humanity, which finds itself in the same pain and darkness. Now, three decades since he wrote this work, as the powers of nihilism and anti-Christianity enter more deeply into the fiber of our society, his words are more needed than ever. Having faced and fought against the nihilism in himself, he is able to help prevent us from being captured by its soul-destroying spirit, and to help us cling to Christ, the eternal truth become flesh. Signed, Monk. Damazine Christensen. Chapter 1. Introduction. The Question of Truth. What is the nihilism in which we have seen 
the root of the revolution of the modern age? The answer, at first thought, does not seem difficult. Several obvious examples of it spring immediately into mind. There is Hitler's fantastic program of destruction, the Bolshevik Revolution, the Dadaist attack on art, there is the background from which these movements sprang, most notably represented by several, quote, possessed individuals of the late 19th century, poets like Rimbaud and Baudelaire, revolutionaries like Bakunin and Nekeyev, quote, prophets, end quote, like Nietzsche. There is, on a humbler level, among our contemporaries, the vague unrest that leads some to flock to magicians like Hitler, and others to find escape in drugs or false religions, or to perpetrate those, quote, senseless, unquote, crimes that become ever more characteristic of these times. But to represent no more than the spectacular surface of the problem of nihilism, to account even for those once one probes beneath the surface is by no means an easy task, but the task we have set for ourselves in this chapter is broader, to understand the nature of the whole movement of which these phenomena are but extreme examples. To do this, it will be necessary to avoid two great pitfalls lying on either side of the path we have chosen, into one or the other, of which most commentators on the nihilist spirit of our age have fallen, apology and diatribe. Anyone aware of the two obvious imperfections and evils of modern civilization that have been more immediate occasion and cause of the nihilist reaction, though we shall see that these two have been the fruit of an incipient nihilism, cannot but feel a measure of sympathy with some, at least, of the men who have participated in that reaction. Such sympathy may take the form of pity for men who may, from one point of view, be seen as innocent, quote, victims of the conditions against which their effort has been directed. Or again, it may be expressed in the common opinion that certain types of nihilist phenomena have actually a, quote, positive significance and its role to play in some, quote, new development of history or of man. The latter attitude, again, is itself one of the more obvious fruits of the very nihilism in question here. But the former attitude, at least, is not entirely devoid of truth or justice. For that very reason, however, we must be all the more careful not to give it undue importance. It is all too easy, in the atmosphere of intellectual fog that pervades liberal and humanist circles today, to allow sympathy for an unfortunate person to pass over into receptivity to his ideas. The nihilist, to be sure, is in some sense sick, and his sickness is a testimony to the sickness of an age whose best, as well as worst, elements turn to nihilism. But sickness is not cured, nor even properly diagnosed by, quote, sympathy. Unquote. In any case, there is no such thing as an entirely, quote, innocent victim, unquote. The nihilist is all too obviously involved with the very sins and guilt of mankind that have produced the evils of our age. And in taking arms, as do all nihilists, not only against real or imagined, quote, abuses, unquote, and, quote, injustices, unquote, in the social and religious order, but also against order itself and the truth that underlies that order. The nihilist takes an active part in the work of Satan, for such it is, that can by no means be explained away by the mythology of the, quote, innocent victim, unquote. No one, in the last analysis, serves Satan against his will. But if, quote, apology, unquote, is far from our intention in these pages, neither is our aim mere diatribe. It is not sufficient, for example, to condemn Nazism or Bolshevism for their barbarism, gangsterism, or anti-intellectualism, and the artistic or literary avant-garde for their pessimism or exhibitionism, 
nor is it enough to defend the, quote, democracies, unquote, in the name of, quote, civilization, unquote, progress, or humanism. For their advocacy of, quote, private property, or civil liberties, unquote. Such arguments, while some of them possess a certain justice, are really quite beside the point. The blows of nihilism strike too deep. Its program is far too radical to be effectively countered by them. Nihilism has error for its root, and the error can be conquered only by truth. Most of the criticism of nihilism is not directed to this root at all. And the reason for this, as we shall see, is that nihilism has become, in our time, so widespread and pervasive, has entered so thoroughly and so deeply into the hearts and minds of all men living today, that there is no longer any, quote, front, unquote, on which it may be fought. And those who think they are fighting it are most often using its own weapons, which they in effect turn against themselves. Some will perhaps object, once they have seen the scope of our project, that we have set our net too wide, that we have exaggerated the prevalence of nihilism, or if not, then the phenomenon is so universal as to defy handling it all. We must admit that our task is an ambitious one, all the more so because of the ambiguity of many nihilist phenomena. And indeed, if we were to attempt a thorough examination of the question, our work would never end. It is possible, however, to set our net wide and still catch the fish we are after, because it is, after all, a single fish, and a large one. A complete documentation of nihilist phenomena is out of the question, but an examination of the unique nihilist mentality that underlines them and of its indisputable effects and its role in contemporary history is surely possible. We shall attempt here, first, to describe this mentality in several, at least, of its most important manifestations and offer a sketch of its historical development, and then to probe more deeply into its meaning and historical program. But before this can be done, we must know more clearly of what we are speaking. We must begin, therefore, with a definition of nihilism. This task need not detain us long. Nihilism has been defined, and quite succinctly, by the fount of philosophical nihilism, Nietzsche. Quote, that there is no truth, that there is no absolute state of affairs, no thing in itself. This alone is nihilism, and of the most extreme kind. End quote. We have encountered this phrase already more than once in this book, and it will recur frequently hereafter. For the question of nihilism is, most profoundly, a question of truth, indeed the question of truth. But what is truth? The question is, first of all, one of logic. Before we discuss the content of truth, we must examine its very possibility and the conditions of its, of its postulation. And by truth, we mean, of course, as Nietzsche's denial of it makes explicit, absolute truth, which we have already defined as the dimension of the beginning and the end of things. Absolute truth. The phrase has... To a generation raised on skepticism and unaccustomed to serious thought, an antiquated ring. No one, surely, is the common idea, no one is naive enough to believe in, quote, absolute truth anymore. All truth, to our enlightened age, is, quote, relative. The latter expression, let us note, all truth is relative, is the popular translation of Nietzsche's phrase, there is no absolute truth. The one doctrine is the foundation of the nihilism alike of the masses and of the elite. Relative truth is primarily represented for our age by the knowledge of science, 
which begins in observation, proceeds by logic, and progresses in orderly fashion from the known to the unknown. It is always discursive, contingent, qualified, always expressed in, quote, relation to something else, never standing alone, never categorical, never absolute, end quote. The unreflective scientific specialist sees no need for any other kind of knowledge. Occupied with the demands of his specialty, he has, perhaps, neither time nor inclination for, quote, abstract questions that inquire, for example, into the basic presuppositions of that specialty. If he is pressed, or if his mind spontaneously turns to such questions, the most obvious explanation is usually sufficient to satisfy his curiosity. All truth is empirical, all truth is relative. Either statement, of course, is a self-contradiction. The first statement is itself not empirical at all, but metaphysical. The second is itself an absolute statement. The question of absolute truth is raised first of all, for the critical observer, by such self-contradictions. And the first logical conclusion to which he must be led is this. If there is any truth at all, it cannot be merely, quote, relative, end quote. The first principles of modern science, as any system of knowledge, are themselves unchangeable and absolute. If they were not, there would be no knowledge at all, not even the most reflective knowledge, for there would be no criteria to classify anything as knowledge or truth. This axiom has a corollary. The absolute cannot be attained by means of the relative. That is to say, the first principles of any system of knowledge cannot be arrived at through the means of that knowledge itself, but must be given in advance. They are the object not of scientific demonstration, but of faith. We have discussed, in an earlier chapter, the universality of faith, seeing it as underlying all human activity and knowledge. And we have seen that faith, if it is not to fall prey to subjective delusions, must be rooted in truth. It is therefore a legitimate and indeed unavoidable question whether the first principles of that scientific faith, for example, the coherence and uniformity of nature, the trans-subjectivity of human knowledge, the adequacy of reason to draw conclusions from observation, are founded in absolute truth. If they are not, they can be no more than unverifiable probabilities. The quote, pragmatic, position taken by many scientists and humanists who cannot be troubled to think about ultimate things, the position that these principles are no more than experimental hypotheses which collective experience finds reliable, is surely unsatisfactory. It may offer a psychological explanation of the faith these principles inspire, but since it does not establish the foundation of that faith and truth, it leaves the whole scientific edifice on shifting sands and provides no sure defense against the irrational winds that periodically attack it. In actual fact, however, whether it be from simple naivete or from deeper insight, which they cannot justify by argument, most scientists and humanists undoubtedly believe that their faith has something to do with the truth of things. Whether this belief is justified or not is, of course, another question. It is a metaphysical question, and one thing that is certain is that it is not justified by the rather primitive metaphysics of most scientists. Every man, as we have seen, lives by faith. Likewise, every man, something less obvious but no less certain, is a metaphysician. The claim to any knowledge whatever, and no living man can refrain from this claim, 
implies a theory and standard of knowledge, and a notion of what is ultimately knowable and true. This ultimate truth, whether it be conceived as the Christian God or simply as the ultimate coherence of things, is a metaphysical first principle, an absolute truth. But with the acknowledgement, logically unavoidable, of such a principle, the theory of the, quote, relativity of truth, unquote, collapses, it itself being revealed as a self-contradictory absolute. The proclamation of the, quote, relativity of truth is, thus, what might be called a, quote, negative metaphysics, but a metaphysics all the same. There are several principal forms of, quote, negative metaphysics, and since each contradicts itself in a slightly different way and appeals to a slightly different mentality, it would be wise to devote a paragraph here to the examination of each. We may divide them into two general categories of, quote, realism and, quote, agnosticism, each of which in turn may be subdivided into, quote, naive and, quote, critical. Quote, naive realism, or quote, naturalism, does not precisely deny absolute truth, but rather makes absolute claims of its own that cannot be defended. Rejecting any, quote, ideal or, quote, spiritual absolute, it claims the absolute truth of, quote, materialism and, quote, determinism. This philosophy is still current in some circles. It is official Marxist doctrine and is expounded by some unsophisticated scientific thinkers in the West, but the main current of contemporary thought has left it behind, and it seems today the quaint relic of a simpler but bygone day, the Victorian day, when many transferred to, quote, science, the allegiance and emotions they once had devoted to religion. It is the impossible formulation of a, quote, scientific metaphysics, impossible because science is, by its nature, knowledge of the particular, and metaphysics is knowledge of what underlies the particular and is presupposed by it. It is a suicidal philosophy in that the materialism and determinism it posits render all philosophy invalid since it must insist that philosophy, like everything else, is, quote, determined. Its advocates can only claim that their philosophy, since it exists, is, quote, inevitable, but not at all that it is, quote, true. This philosophy, in fact, if consistent, would do away with the category of truth altogether, but its adherents, innocent of thought, that is either consistent or profound, seem unaware of this fatal contradiction. This contradiction may be seen, on a less abstract level, in the altruistic and idealistic practice of, for example, the Russian nihilists of the last century, a practice in flagrant contradiction of their purely materialistic and egoistic theory. Vladimir Solovoyev clearly pointed out this discrepancy by ascribing to them the syllogism, quote, man is descended from monkey, consequently, we shall love one another, end quote. All philosophy presupposes, to some degree, the autonomy of ideas. Philosophical, quote, materialism is thus a species of idealism. It is, one might say, the self-confession of those whose ideas do not rise above the obvious, whose thirst for truth is so easily assuaged by science that they make it into their absolute. Quote, critical realism, or quote, positivism, is the straightforward denial of metaphysical truth. Proceeding from the same scientific predisposition as the more naive naturalism, it professes greater modesty in abandoning the absolute altogether and restricting itself to, quote, empirical, quote, relative truth. We have already noted the contradiction in this position. The denial of absolute truth 
is itself an, quote, absolute truth. Again, as with naturalism, the very positing of the first principle of positivism is its own refutation. Quote, agnosticism, like, quote, realism, may be distinguished as, quote, naive and, quote, critical. Quote, naive, or, quote, doctrinaire agnosticism, posits the absolute unknowability of any absolute truth. While its claims seem more modest even than that of positivism, it still quite dearly claims too much. If it actually knows that the absolute is, quote, unknowable, then this knowledge is itself, quote, absolute. Such agnosticism is in fact but a variety of positivism, attempting, with no greater success, to cover up its contradictions. Only in, quote, critical or, quote, pure agnosticism do we find, at last, what seems to be a successful renunciation of the absolute. Unfortunately, such renunciation entails the renunciation of everything else and ends, if it is consistent, in total solipsism. Such agnosticism is the simple statement of fact. We do not know whether there exists an absolute truth or what its nature could be if it did exist. Let us then, if this is the corollary, content ourselves with the empirical, relative truth that we can know. But what is truth? What is knowledge? If there is no absolute standard by which these are to be measured, they cannot even be defined. The agnostic, if he acknowledges this criticism, does not allow it to disturb him. His position is one of, quote, pragmatism, quote, experimentalism, quote, instrumentalism. There is no truth, but man can survive, can get along in the world without it. Such a position has been defended in high places, and in very low places as well, in our anti-intellectualist century. But the least one can say of it is that it is intellectually irresponsible. It is the definitive abandonment of truth, or rather the surrender of truth to power, whether that power be nation, race, class, comfort, or whatever other cause is able to absorb the energies men once devoted to the truth. The quote pragmatist and the quote agnostic may be quite sincere and well-meaning, but they only deceive themselves and others if they continue to use the word truth to describe what they are seeking. Their existence, in fact, is testimony to the fact that the search for truth which has so long animated European man has come to an end. Four centuries and more of modern thought have been from one point of view, an experiment in the possibilities of knowledge open to man, assuming that there is no revealed truth. The conclusion, which Hume already saw and from which he fled into the comfort of, quote, common sense and conventional life, and which the multitudes sense today without possessing any such secure refuge. The conclusion of this experiment is an absolute negation. If there is no revealed truth, there is no truth at all. The search for truth outside revelation has come to a dead end. The scientist admits this by restricting himself to the narrowest of specialties, content if he sees a certain coherence and a limited aggregate of facts, without troubling himself over the existence of any truth, large or small. The multitudes demonstrate it by looking to the scientist not for truth, but for the technological applications of a knowledge which has no more than a practical value, and by looking to other irrational sources for the ultimate values men once expected to find in truth. The despotism of science over practical life is contemporaneous with the advent of a whole series of pseudo-religious, quote, revelations. The two are correlative symptoms of the same malady, the abandonment of truth. Logic, thus, 
can take us this far. Denial or doubt of absolute truth leads, if one is consistent and honest, to the abyss of solipsism and irrationalism. The only position that involves no logical contradictions is the affirmation of an absolute truth which underlies and secures all lesser truths, and this absolute truth can be attained by no relative human means. At this point, logic fails us, and we must enter an entirely different universe of discourse if we are to proceed. It is one thing to state that there is no logical barrier to the affirmation of absolute truth. It is quite another actually to affirm it. Such an affirmation can be based only upon one source. The question of truth must come in the end to the question of revelation. The critical mind hesitates at this point. Must we seek from without what we cannot attain by our own unaided power? It is a blow to pride, most of all to that pride which passes today for scientific, quote, humility, that, quote, sits down before fact as a little child, end quote, and yet refuses to acknowledge any arbiter of fact save the proud human reason. It is, however, a particular revelation, divine revelation, the Christian revelation, that so repels the rationalist. Other revelations he does not gainsay. Indeed, the man who does not accept, fully and consciously, a coherent doctrine of truth, such as the Christian revelation provides, is forced, if he has any pretensions to knowledge whatsoever, to seek such a doctrine elsewhere. This has been the path of modern philosophy, which has ended in obscurity and confusion, because it would never squarely face the fact that it cannot supply for itself what has been given from without. The blindness and confusion of modern philosophers, with regard to first principles and the dimension of the absolute, have been the direct consequence of their own primary assumption, the non-existence of revelation. For this assumption, in effect, blinded men to the light of the sun and rendered obscure everything that had once been clear in its light. To one who gropes in this darkness, there is but one path. If he will not be healed of his blindness, and that is to seek some light amidst the darkness here below. Many run to the flickering candle of, quote, common sense and conventional life and accept, because one must get along somehow, the current opinions of the social and intellectual circles to which they belong. But many others, finding this light too dim, flock to the magic lanterns that project beguiling, multicolored views that are, if nothing else, distracting. They become devotees of this or that other political or religious or artistic current that the, quote, spirit of the age has thrown into fashion. In fact, no one lives but by the light of some revelation, be it a true or a false one, whether it serve to enlighten or obscure. He who will not live by the Christian revelation must live by a false revelation, and all false revelations lead to the abyss. We began this investigation with the logical question, what is truth? That question may, and must, be framed from an entirely different point of view. The skeptic pilot asked the question, though not in earnest, ironically for him, he asked it of the truth himself, quote, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Quote, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Truth in this sense, truth that confers eternal life and freedom, cannot be attained by any human means. It can only be revealed from above by one who has the power to do so. The path to this truth is a narrow one, and most men, because they travel the, quote, broad path, miss it. There is no man, however, for so the God who is truth created him, who does not seek this truth.
we shall examine, in later chapters, many of the false absolutes, the false gods men have invented and worshipped in our idolatrous age. And we shall find that what is perhaps most striking about them is that every one of them, far from being any, quote, new revelation, is a dilution, a distortion, a perversion, or a parody of the one truth men cannot help but point to even in their error and blasphemy and pride. The notion of divine revelation has been thoroughly discredited for those who must obey the dictates of the, quote, spirit of the age. But it is impossible to extinguish the thirst for truth which God has implanted in man to lead them to him, and which can only be satisfied in the acceptance of his revelation. Even those who profess satisfaction with, quote, relative truths, and consider themselves to, quote, sophisticated, or, quote, honest, or even, quote, humble, to pursue the absolute. Even they tire, eventually, of the fare of unsatisfying tidbits to which they have arbitrarily confined themselves, and long for more substantial fare. The whole food of Christian truth, however, is acceptable only to faith, and the chief obstacle to such faith is not logic, as the facile modern view has it, but another and opposed faith. We have seen, indeed, that logic cannot deny absolute truth without denying itself. The logic that sets itself against the Christian revelation is merely the servant of another, quote, revelation of a false, quote, absolute truth namely nihilism. In the following pages we shall characterize as nihilists, men of, as it seems, widely divergent views, humanists, skeptics, revolutionaries of all hues, artists and philosophers of various schools, but they are united in a common task, whether in positivist, quote, criticism, of Christian truths and institutions, revolutionary violence against the old order, apocalyptic visions of universal destruction and the advent of a paradise on earth, or objective scientific labors in the interest of a, quote, better life in this world, the tacit assumption being that there is no other world. Their aim is the same. The annihilation of divine revelation and the preparation of a new order in which there shall be no trace of the, quote, old view of things, in which man shall be the only god there is. Chapter 2. The Stages of the Nihilist Dialectic The nihilist mentality, in the unity of its underlying aim, is single. But this mentality manifests itself in phenomena as diverse as the natures of the men who share it. The single nihilist cause is thus advanced on many fronts simultaneously, and its enemies are confused and deceived by this effective tactic. To the careful observer, however, nihilist phenomena reduce themselves to three or four principal types. And these few types are, further, related to each other as stages in a process which may be called the nihilist dialectic. One stage of nihilism opposes itself to another, not to combat it effectively, but to incorporate its errors into its own program and carry mankind one step further on the road to the abyss that lies at the end of all nihilism. The arguments at each stage, to be sure, are often effective in pointing out certain obvious deficiencies of a preceding or succeeding stage. But no criticism is ever radical enough to touch on the common errors all stages share, and the partial truths which are admittedly present in all forms of nihilism are in the end only tactics to seduce men 
to the great falsehood that underlies them all. The stages to be described in the following pages are not to be understood as merely chronological. Though in the narrowest sense, they are in fact a kind of chronicle of the development of the nihilist mentality from the time of the failure of the nihilist experiment of the French Revolution to the rise and fall of the latest and most explicitly nihilist manifestation of the revolution, National Socialism. Thus, the two decades before and the two after the middle of the 19th century may be seen as the summit of liberal prestige and influence, and J.S. Mill as the typical liberal the age of realism occupies perhaps the last half of the century and is exemplified on the one hand by socialist thinkers, on the other by the philosophers and popularizers, we should perhaps rather say, quote, exploiters, end quote, of science. Vitalism and the forms of symbolism, occultism, artistic expressionism, and various evolutionary and, quote, mystical philosophies is the most significant intellectual undercurrent throughout the half century after about 1875. And the nihilism of destruction, though its intellectual roots lie deep in the preceding century, brings to a grand conclusion in the public order as well as in many private spheres the whole century and a quarter of nihilist development with the consecrated era of destruction of 1914 to 45. It will be noticed that these periods overlap, for nihilism matures at a different rate in different peoples and in different individuals. The overlapping, in fact, is more extreme than our simple scheme can suggest so much so that representatives of every stage can be found in every period, and all of them exist contemporaneously even today. What is true of historical periods is true also of individuals. There is no such thing as a, quote, pure nihilist at any stage. Every predominantly nihilist temperament being a combination of at least two of the stages. Further, if the age since the French Revolution is the first one in which nihilism has played the central role, each of its stages has been represented in earlier centuries. Liberalism, for example, is a direct derivative of Renaissance humanism. Realism was an important aspect of the Protestant Reformation as well as of the French Enlightenment. A kind of vitalism appeared in Renaissance and Enlightenment occultism and again in Romanticism. And the nihilism of destruction, while never so thorough as it has been for the past century, has existed as a temptation for certain extremist thinkers throughout the modern age. With these reservations, however, our scheme may perhaps be accepted as at least an approximation to what has been an undeniable historical and psychological process. Let us then begin our investigation of the stages of this process, the nihilist dialectic, attempting to judge them by the clear light of the orthodox Christian truth, which if we are correct, they exist to obscure and deny. In this section we shall attempt no more than to describe these stages, and to point out by reference to the definition of nihilism we have adopted, in what respect they may be characterized as nihilist.